What's going on everybody? This is Professor Bopper, and today we're going to continue our journey through the Castlevania series. Originally these videos were just going to cover the NES trilogy, but I figured, why not? Let's play some more of the games, and if we're keeping up with the North American console releases, then that plants us right on top of 1989's Game Boy Classic, Castlevania The Adventure. There are two ways to approach talking about Castlevania the Adventure. The first is to regard it as a technical miracle, and the second is to consider it only as a game, independent of its platform and place in history. Wherever you fall between these two points will determine your view towards the adventure, and in this video, I hope to cover both of those views. Released October 1989, the adventure launched only five months into the Game Boy's lifespan. Portability would ultimately define the latter part of Castlevania's run, and much like Simon's Quest, which preludes the Metroidvania style, bumps in the series' inaugural portable entry should be expected. However, the volume and severity of set bumps will, for many players, including myself, make the adventure borderline unplayable. There will be two more, much better Game Boy Castlevanias that showcase just how much can be gotten out of the Game Boy, but the adventure, to the fascination of gaming archaeologists and horror gaming gamers, is from the Paleolithic Game Boy days. Like most early Game Boy games, it's kind of insane that it even exists. I wasn't around in 1989, but I would have shit my pants at the time to see a game like this on the go. In North America, the adventure was the first post-launch Game Boy game released. There was a time, a very brief window, when the Game Boy lineup was Super Mario Land, Tetris, Alleyway, Baseball, Tennis, and Castlevania The Adventure. The release order in Japan is slightly different, but there was a time when The Adventure was absolutely the coolest game on the console and the most sophisticated. 1990 is when the Game Boy library would really begin to fill out. Games like Gargoyle's Quest, the Final Fantasy Legend, and even the very silly Wizards and Warriors 10, The Fortress of Fear, would make the adventure less unique, but no less of a miracle for being the first to squeeze out such style and carnage on the Game Boy's rudimentary tech. Unfortunately, not all miracles are created equal. Castlevania The Adventure is the worst game I've ever played to completion. Now... To be fair, I've played to completion is doing a lot of work. I've played worse, and the first several minutes ain't so bad. In fact, the first impressions of the adventure are otherworldly, especially if you get yourself into that 1989 headspace. Handheld games are themselves an awe-inspiring novelty, and you've got Castlevania on the go. Look at that box art. Castlevania is a series loaded with great box art, from the power fantasy art of the 80s and 90s to the dark anime of the late 90s and early aughts, and the adventure is a contender for best box art. Look how cool it is, and the horrifying Dracula receding against the thunderous power of Christopher Belmont, this game's whip-wielding holy knight. Then, level 1 begins, and Battle of the Holy kicks in on the soundtrack. This is one of the best and most underrated Castlevania themes. It just comes in like... That was um, that was JoJo actually. I I don't remember. Um, I'll put the I'll put the actual music in the video, then you can hear it. Fuck yeah, that's ripping. This is one of the best and most underrated Castlevania themes. Early Game Boy games tend to have an NES at home feel with the black and white graphics and sound specs of the systems, but Battle of the Holy blows right past that. It might not have the banger NES or Famicom disc system speaker, but I don't care and I don't notice. Battle of the Holy gets me hyped and that adrenaline carries for, you know, a few screens. Christopher Belmont moves slowly, but you're whipping monsters and getting power-ups. There might not be sub-weapons, but hey, hearts heal for once, and all the enemies move to be within reach of the whip. And would you look at that? Christopher's whip shoots fireballs! For the first two minutes, the adventure kicks ass. Simple, sure, and a tad slow, but for 1989 Game Boy, I don't think you could ask for more. <laughs> 
What's remarkable about the adventure is that from this point, the game suffers maybe the most precipitous drop in quality I've ever seen, plunging further into hell with more fervor than any other bad game with a good first impression that I can at least think of uh, off the top of my head as I'm just making up the script as I go. The cracks in the adventure will begin to show at a variable point depending on the player, but the first problem almost everyone will encounter is that taking damage downgrades Christopher's whip. I had a fireball! Now I don't. Now I don't even have the Morning Star. I have the shit whip. In Castlevania the First, and in many of the future classic Vanias, upgrading the whip feels like a formality. Sure, your whip resets after every death in Castlevania, but that game quickly gives you the upgrades back, so it's like the best whip should have just always been the default. That continues in the adventure. The game plays with the fireball whip as the intended whip, but unlike other classic Vania, you will almost never have it. With no sub-weapons, Christopher can only attack left and right, so previously annoying enemies like bats or bouncing projectiles become almost unavoidable damage. The bats at the beginning of level 2 are particularly egregious, but no enemy is worse than the Punaguchi. These hand-for-head mouths spit projectiles that bounce all around the room faster than Christopher can move and only leave when they either fly out of bounds or are destroyed. Often, there will be multiple on screen at the same time, and there are instances where avoiding them is basically just playing roulette. Now, I feel myself getting angry, so let's take a break. And let's look at something awesome. The Adventure Manual. That's where I found that the hand guys are called Punaguchi, helpfully labeled on the page, Some Frightful Dudes. There are a bunch of small treasures in the manual, such as the wording, The Valuable Coin Increases Your Point Wealth, and Your Whip Will Become an All-Around Super Weapon Against the Super Freaks. No matter the quality of the game, any ass in Game Boy manuals never disappoint. Despite my frustrations with the combat in the adventure, the game does not at least hyper-focus on combat. While what combat there is often takes for granted the lack of sub-weapons, there isn't that much of it relative to other Castlevania games. Instead, the adventure focuses much more on platforming. In previous game, platforming was mostly between fairly large platforms, sometimes over bottomless pits, and rarely much of it. You were, for the most part, on solid ground. The adventure instead has a ton of platforming, frequently with narrow margins and often in marathon spurts. It's an interesting decision that I can respect intellectually, but in practice... Oh my god. Beyond the whip downgrading on damage, the point of no return for me and likely many other players was a stretch of platforms at the end of level 1. Christopher needs to negotiate a series of thin platforms that require almost pixel-perfect execution, and there's bats flying around and knock your ass around for good measure. It's difficult and frustrating, but also incredibly boring and simple. Failing and having to start over isn't a learning experience, but rather a waste of time. There'd be nothing good about a Guitar Hero song that's all green notes in one rhythm, and so too is this not good platforming. Later on in the game, particularly in the infamous level 3, the platforming gets more interesting, but it's held back by how restrictive jumping and moving are. Because there is no post-jump control over Christopher, and no movement options beyond jumping, walking, and climbing the ropes that replace stairs in this game, every platforming challenge is either execute perfectly or fail. Castlevania combat is often strict or on a razor-thin margin, but the options and variety of tools means that perfect execution often has variable expressions. Jumping, not jumping, rushing, stalling, crosses, stopwatches, and holy water, there's a lot going on. And in comparison, platforming is demanding and restrictive in the adventure is boring. And also frustrating. Level 3 is a massive, grueling slog through several long platforming sections where basically every mistake results in instant death. While there are some cute flourishes, such as this she-worm that baits players to jump into a death trap, this level is overly long and overly difficult. The only way I mustered the patience to finally beat this level and all of the adventure, uh, twice actually, was by flagrantly abusing save states. Sure, it made finally battering Dracula into Game Boy Explosion gore entirely unsatisfying, but also, you know, level 3... Like the other classic games, you do have checkpoints, and then on game over, you are sent to the beginning of the level. I legitimately cannot imagine ever having the wherewithal to do the second, third, and final levels on just three lives. Like Castlevania's ill-begotten arcade game, Haunted Castle, the adventure is way more difficult than it should be, but at least Haunted Castle had a financial incentive to be an asshole. As the credits roll, the adventure feels misguided. An unsteady plunge onto new hardware that has the importance of planting Castlevania's flag in the untouched soils of handheld consoles 
but has little else to offer beyond historical curiosity. It's a shame that Christopher's adventure is so bad, since he's the legendary vampire hunter referenced in the story of Castlevania, but thankfully, he will eventually have his revenge. Now, the good news is that this is one of the few Castlevania games to have ever been fully remade. It was remade as Castlevania The Adventure Rebirth for WiiWare in the 2000s, but we'll get to that game a little bit later. For now, it's time to jump back onto the Famicom Disk System for the much more famous and much more intimidating Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse, and we'll see you in the next video for some extreme suffering. <laughs>